Adam Blue is the commissioner of the Department of Edu Education in the state of New Hampshire, and he was um, uh, uh, put in by our illustrious governor, Sununu. And I don't think there could have been a better choice. I really don't. I, I think Um, I think my first term, I don't know if that was your first term. My only was term. Was it your only term? What a blessing for me. Frank Frank was um, an absolute mover and shaker. His only hard term. Work. Hard, hard worker. Not a mover and shaker. And you know, you were, you were, you made a name for yourself that term and people learned to respect you. It was like almost immediate. There was no question about who Frank Edelblut was mm -hmm. and is. And uh, what a wonderful, wonderful guy. So smart, so talented, and really such a hard worker. And I just think he's the best. I don't think there could have been a better choice. And, and thank God, you know, Sununu's made some wonderful, you know, <laughs> despite what, what Governor Sununu has done recently, and I know that there are people who are disappointed in some of his decisions and some of the things that he's done, but you know, there have been some other things that he has done that he's done very, he's done- Only two things. All right, well, <laughs> this is one of them, okay? He's, listen, if we had somebody else there that was the other way, we wouldn't get any way. Well, if Frank was in, he wouldn't be speaking yeah. to Well, this is my <laughs> Governor. No, I know you're not good. I know you do. All right, so that's that's enough out of my mouth. I'm going to sit down. Frank, thanks for coming. You, have, you, have like, you can speak for 15, 20 minutes, and then after that, we're we'll going to do Q&A. We're okay. going to do Q&A. So, so I won't try and talk too long. I'll go try and get go the Q &A. for it. So first of all, um, that's kind of cool. I didn't realize that we were going to get to talk to Jerry. I mean, he doesn't sound like a guy in federal prison, does he? Does he? No. <laughs> probably like, wait, what? Yeah. Oh, um, so that was very encouraging to be able to hear from him because I haven't heard from him, heard his voice in a long time. Right, yeah. Um, the second thing is, so how many people here are regulars? Just as I look across the group, and how many are some of our visitors that don't normally make it? And where are you guys from? Rochester. Rochester, okay. So by the way, Joe, I, when you were talking about meeting people in Rochester wards, these people were talking to each other as if they were thinking about it. So we might have to like nudge Would them over the head yes, or something yes. like that, and I'm just saying. And then another visitor in the back there, where are some of my other visitors? Yes? Rochester. Rochester, okay. Right, you're a visitor, I know who you are, right? You ever already announced yourself, anybody else? Okay, well welcome. I know these guys up here, right? Yeah. How are you? It's been a while since I saw you. So let me share with you a little bit about what's going on in education these days. Um, and I'm gonna start by just describing um, education in a big context kind of approach so that we can see how uh, kind of it all fits together, but then I'm happy to dive very, very deep if you want um, and share some information with you. Um, so the first thing I think that's important for people to understand is education is in a state of flux. It is something that is moving and more broadly talking, that flux is from what I will refer to as kind of an industrial age of education into an information age of education. And if this is too basic, again, in the questions we can delve deeper. Uh, but that uh, shift really um, is the shift in, in an industrial age. Uh, essentially, you have what's referred to as sort of a stand and deliver model, where the teachers are the experts and they stand and they deliver content to students. And in that model, what we know is that if they were delivering that content to 30 students, 10 got it, 10 got about half, 10 didn't get too much, the bell rang and everybody moved on to the next thing. And we just like, you know, wash, rinse and repeat until the kids are done with the system and they move on. Um, the difficulty was that some of those students who were not getting too much of that education came out of that system and um, didn't, hadn't acquired that much information. Now, at a certain period in history, that was okay because there were vocations. You could go work in a, uh, in a job in a factory or someplace like that, and you could you know, have a middle-class life in America where you could earn enough to buy a house and raise a family. Um, today, those jobs don't exist. We have lots of manufacturing jobs, but most of those manufacturing jobs require you to have, uh, I used to say that they require you to have at least some algebra, you know, algebra one, uh, but guys who uh, own companies that have CNC uh, machining equipment in it will tell you that not only do you have to have 
uh, some algebra, you probably need some geometry along with that as well. Um, and as a result, the economic opportunity for some of those folks are not that great. There's some retail opportunities or something like that, but tough to put it all together. So there is the shift into the information age. Um, and this is one that basically recognizes that students are difficult to manage as cohorts because there's a lot of individuality that takes place in there. And how do we get students to a better outcome? Um, I'll give you an example of you know, how that kind of manifests itself in the school system. Um, so I have been in 100, well, over 100 schools around the state. Um, and I get to go into the schools and I get to spend time with students. I spend time, generally when I go to a school system, I spend time with the school board. I spend time with teachers. I spend time with anybody who will talk to me, quite frankly, parent groups. Um, and uh, you know, anybody who wants, I'm happy to engage. Um, and I can tell you one day I was going through a school system and it was a middle school and I was, as is my custom, I just kind of walk into the classrooms and I engage the students. I'm like, hey, what are you guys learning? What are you talking, you know, talk to the teacher. What are you guys teaching? And uh, this day I was traveling around the school with the principal. We walked into a, uh, a middle school classroom. It was a social studies classroom. And um, the uh, principal had figured out how I do this, and so he just jumped in right with me, very collegial kind of guy. And uh, he blurted out the first question. He says, hey, does anybody, they were, they were studying, so we walked into the classroom, they were studying a period of the, around the uh, World War II, and he blurted out this question, hey, does anybody know anything about um, you know, so, this person, and it was kind of a relatively obscure historical person, I can't even remember who it was at this point in time, but I do remember it was kind of an obscure person. I'm thinking like, why would you ask about that? Um, and I think the point was that then he would have an opportunity to wax eloquently about this relatively obscure historical person and uh, display all his knowledge about all this kind of stuff. But unfortunately for him that day, a young lady in the class shoots up her hand and says, hey, I know something about this guy or this person. Um, and this young lady begins to like list all this information about this relatively obscure historical person. And with a degree of despondence on his, uh, his face, the principal's kind of like, I don't know all this, right? And the girl goes, I saw a special on Netflix, right? And I'm thinking like, oh my gosh, you know, this poor teacher, right? <laughs> and so what this illustrates is, I mean, these students today have more information on these little devices than any of us had in our libraries, right? right. Yep. I mean, so they've got a lot of content. Um, and if you imagine that poor teacher, so that teacher has to be more content rich than Netflix. Good luck with that. They've got a whole <laughs> team of people trying to curate this information. And they've got to be more entertaining to a 12-year-old than Netflix. Really big lift, if you ask me. Is that what Obama's going to be doing on Netflix? <laughs> Could be. I don't know. Yeah, I haven't seen that special yet. Right. But, but essentially, it just tells you that there's this, this movement, there's this change that needs to take place. And so really, the school system is moving and it is trying to find a, um, a different way to get at education. Um, I will share another story with you of the same kind of a thing that just illustrates kind of this shift in education and, and really I think it, you know, the direction that I think we need to be going in and happy to have that conversation with you, but um, visiting a high school this time, and this is a high school that had a CTE center associated with it, and believe it or not, some of the stigma around CTE continues to exist even to this day, and so I was talking with the student council and the vice president of the student council, oh, am I like getting you <laughs> twisting your neck by getting ahead of you there? <laughs> Sorry, I tend to move around a little bit. Um, but anyway, so the, student, the vice president of the student council, he, uh, we're in, in this engaging conversation, and he says, those students who go to CTE don't do good in school. CTE? <laughs> CTE, career technical education, right? So vocational types of you know, stuff. Um, so first of all, um, for those of you who had, didn't hear, listen that closely to that, I said to him, I said, first of all, who's your English teacher? Because it's not that the CTE students don't do good in school, they don't do well in school. So I don't know what you're not doing. But, um, but then the second thing I said, is it really that the students who go to the CTE center don't do well in school or the school doesn't do well with the students who go to the CTE center, right? I mean, is it really kind of this, you know, we build this monolithic and kids either conform. I mean, is that what we're doing? Are we trying to train kids to just like, you know, follow rules and conform, or are we actually trying to help them learn something, right? I was with a teacher just the other day, and I know no malice on the part of the teacher, but the teacher said in the course of the conversation, 
you know, my job is just to get them to June. I'm like, no, that's not your job. Your job is to teach them something, right? And we don't even care if they learn it by June or they learn it in April, they get it in January. Like whatever it is, the goal is to try and educate them and teach them. And so I like to describe it as what we have essentially done is we've built what I'll refer to, and I think you ladies, some of you guys are from ed in education, weren't you? No, oh, okay. But we've built what I call a linear learning model, right? So it's this kind of straight line progression that we've given to, uh, to students. Um, but that's not what, how learning science works. That's not how people learn. And I say to people, especially parents, I mean, say, go home, open the closet, and look at the little hash marks on the inside of the door, like what would mark off, demark where your kids were growing. You know, sometimes those marks are close together, sometimes there was a big gap. And it turns out that we learn the same way we grow, right? There's spurts, it's not a linear process. So essentially, you know, this is the system, but we've got kids who are going like this, and they plateau for a little bit, then they have a growth spurt, and they move along. Um, but the difficulty is we've got this system that calibrates everybody, oh, wait, oh, it's June 16th. Okay, everybody's on the line again, right? So you take a cute couple kids, you pull them down, take a couple kids, you push them up, and everybody's on the line, and we go to the next, year, next um, progression. And as a result of that, um, students end up with gaps in their education, right? There's Because if you just get plugged onto the line, but you missed a bunch of concepts, but the next year they're moving on because this linear system just keeps going, how is that going to work out for you? And what that has done is it's manifested itself. You can see the evidence of this problem when we look at our performance um, as a state. Now, first of all, New Hampshire is a top performing state in the country, right? Okay, we're gonna acknowledge that. We're one of the top performers. It means just like, when, aren't you glad we're not one of the low performers, right? <laughs> but anyway, so we say to kids, we've got um, you know, academic standards, and that's a whole separate conversation, but I mean, the system gave us academic standards. These are the things that you need to know to be successful in the 21st century, kids. So learn, get them, right? We put these kids through this system, we give them an assessment in 11th grade, and 44% of the kids get to that goal. Oh, wait a minute, hang on. But we graduate 90% of the kids. So think about that. We say, here's what you need to do to be successful. We get less than half of the kids to that goal, and we graduate 90% of the kids. I mean, like, you don't have to be good at math to figure out that there's a problem with that, right? But it even gets... It's a big problem. Well, it's, yeah, it's certainly a problem, right? Like the system. But think about it, if you come from, that is 44%, that's the average, right? But if you look at my student performance, if you come from a family in poverty, so a free and reduced family, which is basically about 300% of federal, federal poverty level or below, you have a 21% chance of being successful in that system. Think about that for a second. So you come out of a family in poverty, you got a one in five chance of being successful in school. I mean, the system, these are not my numbers, this is the system's information, right? The system says, this is what you need, if you come out of poverty, you got a one in five chance actually being successful. If you come, if you have an IEP, individual education plan, uh, anybody want to guess what your chances of success are on that? Under 10%. Under 10. Under 10. Eight. Eight percent. Hang on one second for a question. So I will tell you that, um, and an IEP student, just to be clear, so we have at the state, we have something that's called a DLM. So if a, these are students are taking the assessment who the educator says, yes, they should take this assessment, right? Because sometimes an IEP can be serious. And if, a, you know, and if the student is not capable of taking the assessment, we give them what's referred to as a DLM or alternative assessment. So these are only the students who the system said, yes, this is the assessment you should take. And we get 8% of them to that goal, 8%. And so, um, you know, I often say, so I'll have advocates coming into my office, uh, particularly around students with IEPs and stuff like that, and they're saying, we need to do more, we need to do more. I'm like, well, hang on a second, you got an 8% shot at this. Like, that's not, like, why would you double down on a system that has an 8% success rate? You might try something different. You might go in a different direction. It reminds me, sometimes I'll see, you know, students who are struggling, right? And uh, they're not getting through the system. And what do we do? We just say, like, well, we're going to do some more of the same thing. Obviously, what's the definition of insanity? Doing the same thing over and over again and somehow expecting a different result, but we just keep doubling down. And we've, you know, I've heard from parents who sometimes are frustrated because it almost feels like we've exhausted all of our tools in order to be able to, uh, to help these students, but that's, those are the tools we have, so we just keep repeating them and repeating them over and over. Wow. Um, which is 
why you know we need to have a system. We need to move the system that recognizes that um, you can't manage students as cohorts, and that's what we really do, right? We manage them as if they're this homogeneous group, and that they all are the same, and they learn the same, and they uh, respond the same. Um, when you manage them as cohorts, it's going to it's going to be lumpy. I think that really what we're after is a system that recognizes the individuality of those students and creates different pathways for those students through the system, uh, through choice types of programs, through different alternative pathways. Uh, one of the things that I've had the, the pleasure really of doing uh, in the last couple in the last month is I get to go to a lot of graduations. Um, and I particularly like going to what I refer to as alt high schools. You guys know what alt high schools are? No. So alt high schools are kids, some kids, like they just, they're not doing well and they're at risk of dropping out and they've run them through the system enough time, like, okay kid, you've been through the ringer enough times, you've repeated, we failed them, we put them, you know, they fail, so we, do, we repeat them, like as if something changed, right? Like, they didn't get the first time, so we'll just keep doing it over and over again, you know, and maybe you'll get it. So the all high schools basically create alternative pathways and the kids are out of uh, kind of the mainstream classrooms um, and they have a little bit more flexibility. Uh, flexibility. Uh, you know, so they, they recognize that these kids, many of these kids need to move, right? They're not good at sitting still for like, you know, six hours a day being talked at. And so they give them the flexibility to be able to move and to engage in learning and then get up and go over and engage in learning or something else, you know, some other approach. And um, so when I talk to those kids, they're my heroes because these are kids who, when I ask them about their stories, why are you in this alternative program? They're like, you know what? There was too much drama going on over there at the high school. Uh, you know, I just couldn't sit still and let somebody talk at me for that long. I needed to move. I needed to do something different. But they recognized that they needed, they, they understood the value of the education. Um, and they just recognized, I just needed a different approach. And so they come over here and they're successful. And they're getting out of high school and they're learning stuff. And that's exactly what we want to see happen for those students. Um, so. What we really are looking for are, and that's just why I'm an advocate, um, you know, I'm, I'm an advocate for options for our students so that, you know, students can find different ways to plug in. I'm an advocate for trying to capture all of student learning and trying to find ways that, you know, I don't really care where a kid gets it, but if a kid's learning, then that ought to count. So um, can, we, can we capitalize on it and make it count for those students? Um, and so this is, you know, I share that, this is kind of the direction, this is what's happening in the education system. There's a lot of details behind that. Uh, but what I want to do now is just like pause and just take questions from you guys and, and, uh, and see what's on your mind so that I don't, I can work on that. Thank you. Questions? Yes, we're going to do questions. Rock TV.